Game development has always been hit with barriers to entry and various roadblocks on any level, from one-man projects to massive blockbuster titles. Some of these hurdles cannot be changed, such as hardware specifications or funding. With these, some developers use the issues to their advantage and push the boundaries of conventional game design in the process. Creative limitation is the concept of purposely limiting oneself to harness creativity. Usually this is reserved to art, as Phil Hansen explained in a TED talk back in 2013. Hansen discusses the idea of embracing the shake, where he developed a condition in which his hand would uncontrollably shake. Obviously, as an artist, this was detrimental to his career, until he realized something. Embracing the limitation would drive creativity. With this, Hansen was able to think outside the box and further push his art to crazy new levels. This is where games come in. Now the definition Hansen coined was based around self-imposed limitations. While most restrictions in game development usually came down to hardware back in the day, and most recently monetary ones, the process is still the same. Creative limitations pushing the boundaries of creativity. Back when home gaming was resurrected by Nintendo, the NES was king. And while some developers for the console clearly threw anything they could at walls to see what would stick, usually resulting in a mess of mechanics and nonsensical gameplay, others embraced what the 8-bit machine was capable of, and in turn, found unique ways around problems that are now staples in the industry. While Metroid was being developed, the original plan was to have Samus crawl on all fours to progress through the tight spaces of Planet Zebes. However, animating Samus crawling provided to be incredibly difficult, so the animators and designers came up with a solution that would become one of the defining mechanics of the series, the Morph Ball. This small workaround is now a core mechanic in every game of the franchise, using it to enhance and really drive home the series' emphasis on exploration. No matter how dated some older games seem to get, one thing that has remained constantly loved and adored by all with classic games is the soundtracks. Remixed and reimagined by fans over the years, the iconic melodies of games such as Mario and Zelda were made purposely earwormy due to how incredibly limited the sound chip is. Composer Koji Kondo stated in an interview, I think when I'm making music, and by that I mean game music, one of the things I focus on is making music that people won't grow tired of. So I would create a piece of music. And one thing that I do is listen to it over and over and over and over and over again. If I find myself getting into the music without growing tired of it, then I think, okay, this has the potential to be something that we can use. With this, we can see exactly why gamers today love the classic tunes of the olden days and just how they came to be beloved by many. During its creation, Metal Gear was planned to be a high-octane action game to stand alongside current shooters at the time. The problem was, they were building the game for the Japanese-only MSX2, which even at the time was a primitive machine that couldn't handle more than a couple enemies on screen at a time. To get around this, while the heads at Konami tried everything they could to get the game to function as an action game, a fresh-faced Hideo Kojima had an amazing idea. He suggested the game revolve around stealth rather than straight-up action. And with that, Metal Gear was born with the side effect of creating the entire stealth genre with it. While initially scorned for the idea, when it proved to be the only viable option for Metal Gear, they caved, paving the way for many more stealth games to come. Once the 3D era came crashing onto the scene, all the extra RAM and processing power opened up a world of new possibilities. However, many developers were still ahead of themselves with what they wanted to do with their games. So again, creative solutions to problems were found. Konami's Silent Hill series is still regarded to be some of the scariest in the horror genre, with moody atmosphere, psychological mindfucks, and incredibly haunting music. A lot of what makes Silent Hill so, maybe I'll just leave the lights on, scary, is the fantastic use of fog, hiding all kinds of monsters and unknowns for the player to fear. But it wasn't always intended. Being an early game boasting open world exploration, it proved to be difficult to render that kind of draw distance on a 32-bit PlayStation. The team came up with a plan, hide the loading behind the fog, so the game generated what was coming up as you Progressed. Rather than hinder exploration with a ton of screens to break immersion, the idea of hiding what the game was loading carried on over different generations and genres. Just look to doors in Metroid Prime, the vast oceans in Wind Waker, and the elevators in Mass Effect. Similar to Silent Hill hiding its load times and scares in Fog, Capcom's Resident Evil used a different but equally effective technique. Make the load screen a quick cutscene of a door opening. With its high angle fixed perspective setting, the juxtaposition of switching to first person to enter the next room just increased the game's tension to great effect. I mean, who didn't shit their pants the first time they opened the mansion's front door and was greeted by some lovely dogs looking for a pet? 
While blockbuster games seemingly have unlimited budgets to create beautiful and massive experiences we couldn't even dream of growing up, the indie scene has their own limitations, money and exposure. While crowdfunding services like Kickstarter and Indiegogo have helped small timers fund their visions, they still offer up the minimum of what is needed, with hardly any room to breathe, even if the game exceeds its initial funding goal. Not to mention how absolutely flooded the indie marketplace is. It's hard to get your game noticed, so standing out is an absolute must. Whether it's through incredibly refined gameplay like Yacht Club's Shovel Knight, or a unique aesthetic seen in Inkstain Games' 12 is better than 6. Finding your niche in a crowded space and really honing in on it is how most seem to survive in the flooded market. While not crowdfunded, Fez gained massive hype from its distinct 2D to 3D world that makes mechanics and visuals into a seamless experience. And well, there is the obvious example that is Minecraft, but I'm sure you all know how that story goes. Much like Minecraft and Fez, other one-man development team games have been popping up. Titles like Axiom Verge and Stardew Valley take an old genre and apply new age methods to them. In this case, the Metroidvania and Life Sim, respectively. While Axiom Verge wore its inspirations on its sleeve, developer Tom Happ made his own mark by having incredibly unique weapons that interacted with the environments, as both tools for progression and killing. While Concerned Ape took what everyone loved about Harvest Moon growing up and gave it to a more mature audience. With more adult themes coupled with solid combat and satisfying exploration, Stardew Valley acts as the next logical step for the genre. The influence of early day creativity has worked its way back into the way we go about video games, due to the rise of the indie developer. The gamers that grew up with the brutality of early day 8-bit era are now the adults creating the way we play. We can see just how creatively difficult early days has influenced modern indie smash hits such as Super Meat Boy, Axiom Verge, The Binding of Isaac, and Stardew Valley. While creative limitation is still a relatively new phrase, it's clear that developers worked with incredible restraints across all generations, and that effect has bled into how we conceptualize, develop, and play games today. So the next time you're daunted by any roadblocks that may encroach on whatever you want to do creatively, try thinking outside the box and embrace the limitations.